I have a message for all of us great theologians. Listen to the Apostle Paul's word to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12. He said, and by the way, I suspect he was a greater theologian than all of us. He said, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. For now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Someday we will know all there is to know about the Bible. But I can tell you right now that we know so little today. Someone has said that the Bible is the Word of God that displays the mind of God. And therefore, all of us can search the Scriptures all the days of our lives and merely scratch the surface only. Gary Stimmon is here to discuss with me an article that I put in our March 2009 edition of Prophecy in the News magazine called Six Blind Men and an Elephant. My Gary, how blind we really are. Mm. And you know, J.R., it's a humbling uh, idea that, that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, if you think of yourself as super powerful and accomplished in your uh, theological uh, expertise and, and your breadth of wisdom, and uh, you think that you've pretty much got it figured out, maybe, <laughs> just maybe, uh, you ought to consider the words of the Lord. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, he said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He spoke that to Isaiah. Now, J.R. Isaiah had, had received direct, the direct word of the Lord. And mm -hmm. at the very same time, the Lord's cautioning him, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> there were no theologians greater than the Jews. That's true. The Jewish theologians. Actually, theology is a Greek word, so I just have to say the Jewish sages. That's correct. Those who studied the word of God. But listen to what Isaiah said to them. In Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Gary, one day I met a Jewish scholar. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that he was a scholar until he told me. But in the course of our conversation I said, You know, I've studied the Bible all my life. And I would have to admit that I'm only a student of the Word of God. I've never really met any scholars. And he said, well, I'm a scholar. Well, <laughs> how about that? Very good. Now, it's nice to be a scholar. But I can tell you that long before scholarship, there were God's men groping around in the Scriptures. Do you remember when the Lord said to Daniel, shut up the book and seal, seal the words? Until the time of the end, then knowledge shall be increased. Well, God was saying by that, that he was able to close down certain areas of men's minds and thinking. And give them only a piece of the puzzle. Indeed, when I look at a piece, when I look at a puzzle, you know, a thousand pieces puzzle. I sit there and I look at it. The first thing I want to do is find the pieces with all the straight edges. Hmm. Without that, I have no clue as to what to do. <laughs> All of which brings us to a discussion of our March Prophecy in the News. On the cover, uh, you'll see a, uh, an Oriental uh, artist's conception of six blind men and an elephant. And we all know about those six <coughs> blind men groping around for the elephant, which re represents the truth. Uh, J.R., when he designed the cover, I want you to notice this, has cleverly uh, placed a little light bulb down here in the blackness. <laughs> what is that light bulb all about, J.R.? Well, you know, seven years ago, I was on my way to a prophecy conference in Houston, going from the hotel to the church. And uh, in the van were uh, several of the speakers, and uh, Hal Lindsay and I were discussing some finer points of the book of Revelation. When he, in a sheer moment of inspiration, said, Well, you know, J.R., we're all groping in the darkness looking for the light switch. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that truer words were never spoken. All of us great theologians who have our ideas on prophecy, I want you to know that we only have a piece of the puzzle. 
God gives to one a piece of the puzzle. God gives to another piece of the puzzle. And you know what we do with the pieces? We go around beating each other over the head with our piece of puzzle. <laughs> Instead of saying, hey, come on, let's see if we can't make this, make some, something out of what we have learned. So, I want to read to you a poem that was written back in the last century uh, by John Godfrey Sachs. Uh, he was born in 1816, died in 1887, and sometime during his adult life, he wrote this poem. And I think it's most appropriate for today. He writes, It was six men of Indostan, to learning much inclined, who went to see an elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second feeling of the tusk cried, Ho, oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to me it's mighty clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out an eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, In the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact, who can? This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth, no sooner had begun about the beast to grope, than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so, these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. So, oft in theologic wars, that's battles, Gary, <laughs> mm. The disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. Hmm. Most appropriate. For you see, theologians grope about this wonderful book, and we see a little here and a little there, but in reality we do not know enough about it to argue with each other. So the purpose of this program is to say, fellas, let's get together. Let's stop browbeating each other and declaring how utterly silly and stupid each other are. Let's realize that the Apostle Paul said, we see through a glass darkly. I think uh, that would be appropriate for us to let everybody know that only all of us or should I say each of us has, but a piece of the puzzle. And J.R., the, the theme of this poem is that all of these observers, the six observers, if you will, uh, were right. Each one had a l legitimate and valid uh, point uh, and probably would have been willing to argue that point to the death because uh, I know what I feel here and I am right. <laughs> and that's the irony of this poem. <laughs> yes, you know, with the Cumberland Revival of the last century, the late 1800s, uh, many of the denominations across America sprang up through this revival. And it, it all had to do with debating each mm -hmm. other, uh, or at least a lot of it did. And uh, so out of it came, oh, today, my over 1,500 different denominations of Christianity, and most of them are divided upon a little silly things. They are. Now, let's begin by saying that uh, we have righteousness uh, through Christ 
by grace, through faith, and we are justified by faith. It's a gift of God. It, it is nothing that we have done. And, and that's a starting point, I think, J.R. But Gary, but Gary, but what? there are those who would say, no, 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 we are saved by works. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the first point of, you know, cutting each other's throats. Listen, I am not talking about other religions here. I'm not talking about those who knew the light and turned from the light to darkness. Romans chapter 1 tells us that there mm -hmm. were some people who knew the truth. Yeah. And they deliberately turned from the truth to darkness. In, and in fact, J.R., since you've brushed past that, I happen to have my Bible open to Romans. And, you know, this is fascinating. Uh, Romans 1.19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Yes. You could read all of the, of, the, of the discourse, but that little phrase right there, uh, the things that may be known of God is manifest in men, if the men would choose to receive that which the Lord plainly tells them. That's, that's the issue. Yeah. You know? Paul is saying uh, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all God ungodliness and unrighteousness, unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And J.R., he's saying you have the truth, but you mm -hmm. just refuse to look at it. Yeah, and here it is. It's this blessed book. The Bible is the word of God. But those who would look at another book, they knew the light and turn to darkness. We're not talking about them. The Muslims are not blind men groping around the elephant. The Hindus and Buddhists are not blind men groping around the elephant. They have rejected the light. Hmm. I'm talking about those who believe the book. They are the ones who are blind. We are all blind. Those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and love the Lord Jesus Christ some of us believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, and, or uh, some believe in premillennialism, some believe well, in postmillennialism, some in amillennialism, and some in no millennial. That's, well, that's, all millennial, that's true. And le and let's back up a notch. I'll, I'll say to you, just as you said to me a moment ago, J.R. Some would not even believe in a rapture of the church at all. Yes. Uh, in fact, they'll say that word's not in the Bible, and then proceed from there and say, I am much more comfortable believing in a second coming of some sort and then they would begin to preach that position uh, and so we're really talking here uh, about how we should approach scripture uh, and I'm totally with J.R. on this I, I would like to think of myself as a peacemaker I don't want to go around calling names kicking shins mm -hmm. making accusations and so forth uh, and yet there's a lot of that going on today <laughs> oh indeed <laughs> And, but the interesting thing is, if only all of us theologians, those of us who study the scriptures and disseminate our teachings to our constituencies, if we would all just be a little more tolerant, it sure would go a long ways. Let's talk about the rapture for a moment. Uh, you know, Paul referred to it as the blessed hope. Uh, J.R., I like the idea of hope. Uh, the old human statement about hope is this, where there's life, there's hope, uh, you know? And in fact, when hope disappears, life begins to ebb away. The ultimate hope is found in the scripture. And Paul refers to that idea of the rapture as the scripture, the idea that the Lord said, you know, and he talked to his intimates on this subject, and he said, I'm going to go away for a while, won't be able to talk to you much longer. And... Uh, he said, it, in my, uh, my father's universe, let me just paraphrase, there are many, many dwelling places, and I'm going to go prepare one for you, and then I'm going to come back. J.R., it's really hard to dilute that very much. Yes. I'm looking for the promise of his coming. Now, the details, we can yeah. talk about the details. John chapter 14. <laughs> well, remember Thomas? Oh, yeah. Lord? We don't know where you're going. You're How right. can we know the way? Yeah. <laughs> That's Thomas. That sounds just like a lot of Christians today. Yeah. You know, we don't know where the Lord's gone. We don't understand why he's been gone so long. We don't even think he's going to come back again. Oh, yeah, I know he said he's going to come back again, but we don't have any proof of that. You know, people have such funny ideas. 
We all know so little about the Word of God. Let, let me just give you some of the comments that were made about these six blind men and an elephant. Okay. The six blind men conclude that the elephant is like a wall, a snake, a spear, a fan, a tree, or a rope, depending on where they touched. They have a heated debate, but in Sachs's version, the conflict is never resolved. Now, in some Far Eastern version, the six men are told, all of you are right. The reason every one of you is telling it differently is because you've touched a different part of the elephant. So actually, the elephant has all of the features you mentioned. Well, this resolves the conflict, and the six blind men live in harmony, though each holds to his particular version. That's one conclusion of the story. In another version, the six men come to blows. <laughs> This delights the storyteller who says, Oh, how they cling and wrangle. Some who claim for preacher and monk the honored name. For quarreling each to his view they cling. Such folk see only one side of a thing. And then in another version, there were five blind men at first, and their conflict became extremely violent. The argument grew more heatedly, and finally escalated into a battle, for each of, them ha each of the five had followers. This became known as the Battle of the Five Armies. Then a sixth blind man feels the entire elephant and thinks, what a bunch of fools those men are. And an oracle, an angelic woman, shows up and tells them that they are all right and that the elephant is a giant tree. And on this tree grows leaves like great fans to give a most wondrous shade. And the branches are like spears to protect it. And for this this is the tree of creation, she said, and eternal life. And the great serpent still hangs upon it. For, unfortunately, it is hidden behind a great wall, which is why it was not discovered until this very day. So, see, by twisting the truth into an original perspective that harmonizes the discarded elements, the oracle stops the war. And then she tells them that she can teach them for a price... How to use the rope she's found, that is the elephant's tail, and climb the elephant, thus gain eternal life. Her price is exceptionally high because, quote, eternal life does not come cheap, <laughs> end of quote. <laughs> the moral of the story is that anyone can lead blind men to an elephant, but only an oracle can charge admission. Now, Gary, <laughs> that is so true. There are so many people out to to make money off of this notion of eternal life. A great deal of money has exchanged hands uh, selling religions all over the world, J.R. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, we could tell stories about that until the end of this uh, program, but yeah. uh, the, the point that we're trying to make here <clears throat> is that we are open to the leading of the Lord. I think J.R. and I are, are of one mind on this. Uh, it's not my mind that's doing the uh, discerning. And it's not my mind that is doing uh, whatever you may conceive of as a, uh, an original thought or, or an idea. All those things come from the Lord, J.R. And yep. seeking the Lord is a process of yielding yourself rather than asserting yourself. That's probably the best way I can put it. That's right. And... We are not here to discount your piece of the puzzle. If you have a piece of the puzzle that I don't have or that Gary doesn't have, mm -hmm. we're not here to say your puzzle doesn't mean anything. Your piece of the puzzle. What we're trying to do is elevate all the pieces of the puzzle so that we come together and try to understand the whole picture. Realizing, of course, that in this life we will never be able to understand it all until that day when we step into the light, as the Apostle Paul said, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. There's one more sequel to this little story ah. of the six men and the elephant, and I want to just give it here. In the unwritten sequel of the classic poem, we go a thousand years further onto a world in which vast temple complexes have been built by the followers of each of the theoreticians. <laughs> and holy war is waged against all to dispute that an elephant is very much like a tree or a wall 
or a rope. Even worse, cults arise venerating fans and ropes as elephants. And devotees plant bombs in the automobiles of those who insist that a wall is just a wall and not an elephant at all. <laughs> wow, that rhymes. Isn't that <laughs> a neat? A wall is just <laughs> a wall. and not Bombs in <laughs> <and> automobiles. <laughs> Indeed. And J.R., how, how very current that is. Here's the thing. And J.R., we get... Uh, a lot of, of email. And we get uh, old-fashioned snail mail. We love to get letters, by the way. Uh, I, I really enjoy reading letters, and I'm going to be right up front with you. Not every letter I get is complimentary. Would you believe that? <laughs> I've gotten some very hot mail from people who flatly say, you are wrong, and here's why you're wrong. J.R., I delight in such mail. If somebody has a point that I haven't seen, I want to see it. And, uh, and, and I try to receive it in that spirit. Yeah. I got an email last week where a fellow said that this cancer that I have is God's judgment on me for my views oh on my the scripture. Goodness. Well. <laughs> Such are the blind who put bombs in other people's automobiles. You oh, know? yes. So, look, folks. Let's be nice. There's no need for us to go around fussing and fighting with each other. The Bible is the Word of God. If you believe that, that every word of this Bible is verbally inspired of God, then search it for the wondrous food that it has for you. It has milk for the young and meat for the adults and candy for us all. Oh, yeah. So just enjoy it, will you? Knowing that one of these days, when we get to heaven, we will step into the light. Well, J.R., uh, there's a point here that I'd like to, to add to the mix, <clears throat> and it's where uh, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. In the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, he, he says, the natural man, that is the man just walking the street out there, the unredeemed man simply cannot receive spiritual things. Then he adds this <clears throat> in verse 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, that's the other side of the coin. God tells Isaiah, my thoughts are way above your thoughts. But on the other hand, Paul tells us we have the mind of Christ. So it's not all hopeless. With the proper uh, spiritual perspective there is much truth to be gleaned there and and it is in that spirit that we come to you on prophecy in the news sharing ideas that drive us that delight us and believe me we're delighted in the thought that the Lord might come back even today mm -hmm. um, yes I, I believe in the imminent return of Christ and uh, that he could come at any moment so that means then, of course, we're not date setters, but, you know, we feel that we are so close. Yes. That things are happening around this world, and we don't understand the theology of it all. We just see bits and pieces of what's happening and say, well, that sounds like a prophecy fulfilled, yeah. you know? Now, J.R., prophecy uh, teaching can be formalized, or it can be very much off the cuff. And I would give an example the preachers, let's say in the last 40 years, who have stood up in their pulpits and, and with great emotion they have closed their sermons by saying, Jesus is coming soon. And, and they mean it. Yeah. Something has told them, uh, an inward leading, if you will, that we're living in the time of Christ's coming. J.R., to me, that is a move of the Spirit. Uh, and I don't reject proclamations like that from the pulpit. I think Jesus is coming soon. Now we can argue about how soon, mm -hmm. in what manner, uh, in what style, to which de denomination will he come first. Uh, we can have all kinds of arguments like that, but Jesus is coming soon. Yeah. Dr. B. H. Carroll was one of the great men of the last century. Uh, in fact, he is credited with being the father of the Texas public school system. He also is the founder of Baylor University. He said to, to, uh, uh, to W.B. Riley one time, who is a pre-millennialist, mm -hmm. and B.H. Uh, Carroll was a post-millennialist. Uh -huh. He said to W.B. Riley, 
of all of the people I know who study the Bible, the men who believe in the pre-millennial second coming of Christ are the finest and most dignified and the uh, most loving and the, and the nicest men I've ever met. Mm. So those of us who believe the book, we are much more tolerant than those who have their little side views, you know. Oh, yes. Um, and so we don't come to you from men who want to lay down our swords. We're coming to you who bear the swords and say, hey, put up your sword. Let's talk about this, shall we? And to those of you who do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I can tell you that he is coming soon. We don't know when. But you don't have another day that can be guaranteed to you for you to get ready to meet the Lord. So I would ask you today to trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Tell him that you know you're a sinner and you're sorry. Ask him to forgive you and save you. He will, you know. He loves you. He came and died for you. So trust him today. Just pray a simple sinner's prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my heart and life and save my soul. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll pray that prayer or one like it, Jesus will hear your prayer. He who loves you and died for you will give you eternal life. Gary, final word? A final word. If Jesus could walk into where you are right now and sit down beside you, uh, he'd have this question for you. Do you love me? And you know what? The answer is up to you. Yeah. Well, this is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time. Keep looking.